Okay, all right, well, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, my name is Royan Kamyar. I'm running this company called O Waves, um, and we're in the mobile health space, uh, specifically on the preventive side. So, um, I'm going to break up this talk into three equal parts, okay? So, the first part is gonna really just going to talk about Apple and what it's doing in health and why this is a really exciting time to be an iOS programmer. <laughs> and I think the rock stars of medicine are actually, you know, right here. Uh, I think the engineers are the new rock stars of medicine. Um, and so I just want to tell you where I think the opportunities are and where you can make a contribution. Um, so basically the first part, we'll talk about what Apple's doing in health, how they're creating this ecosystem that we all can be a part of. Uh, the second part just kind of goes a little bit into my personal background, why I think I have a unique perspective, um, which leads into the third part, which is really identifying specifically where the opportunities are um, under the categories of lifestyle medicine and preventive medicine and really defining what are, um, can be considered a new set of vital signs. And I think the prototypical examples happening with Fitbit and what they're doing with steps. Um, clinicians never really talked about steps in terms of research or prescriptions or discussions with their patients, but now we're using units of steps to prescribe what would be the best therapy for someone who just got diagnosed with uh, knee osteoarthritis, how many steps they should be taking, whether it be a period of weeks or months. So this is, these are new conversations that technology is enab enabling and creating. So, um, we're armed with these devices, right? So we have the iPhone with its unique set of sensors, the ambient light, um, M8 motion processor, uh, GPS, um, proximity sensor, barometer, microphone, camera, NFC, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. What can we do with this? And now we have an, an, another set, another piece of hardware with its own unique set of sensors and um, apparently more being added on. Um, ambient light detector, accelerometer, gyroscope, compass, optical heart rate sensor that uses visible light, infrared LEDs, and photodiodes, microphone, um, NFC, Bluetooth, uh, Wi-Fi leveraging off the phone, Apple S1 processor, and um, apparently rumors are that the camera, a camera will be added on to the next device. So these are the tools we have. And then what else is going on under the Apple umbrella? They've made a bunch of major hires in the space, and this has all been going on within the last really two years. So uh, Michael O'Reilly is a physician. Uh, he used to be a professor at University of Michigan and UC Irvine. Um, he was picked up from Massimo, which was really the category leader in pulse oximetry. Um, so basically optical sensors. That just happened in July 2013. Jay Blanick, he was basically the creative brains behind Nike Plus and Nike Fuel Band. Um, he was also picked up in uh, July 2013. Divya Nag, she led the Stardex uh, med program at Stanford, so they gave birth to Lark and a couple other um, reasonably successful digital health companies. Um, she has a background, um, graduated from Stanford, did some research in stem cells, and then got really um, adept at digital health. Uh, Ravi Narasimhan has a PhD in uh, electrical engineering from Stanford. Um, he's behind their R&D. He was at Vital Connect, um, very savvy about respiration, activity monitoring. Uh, Todd Whitehurst, MD, PhD from UCSF, Stanford, um, Director of Hardware Development. He was picked up from Sensionics in July 2013. Um, he was involved with uh, glucose detection, uh, non-invasive continuous glucose monitoring. Um, Nancy Doherty, the list goes on, of, of these major hires. They're basically cherry-picking from some of the best uh, biosensing companies um, in the space. So basically, um, you know, d and it's all happening recently. So December 2013, she was at Proteus Digital Health, which many of you may know, we're doing the smart pill, um, and Sano Intelligence, basically wearable device, um, you know, uh, continuous biometric tracking. Um, Wayne Block, um, director, uh, PhD from Stanford, director of optical engineering. He was picked up from CA me C8 Metasensors, optical sensing expert. Um, Gracie Agrawal, um, she's an expert in EEG detection, so we haven't seen any specific devices around neuromonitoring from Apple yet, but not only is she there, but Roy uh, Raymond, um, another PhD from the Netherlands, um, he was picked up from Philips Research, he's a sleep specialist. So even though the Apple Watch isn't really doing much on sleep yet, um, you know, we can assume that they're stacking the deck in that direction. Um, okay, so this is actually a really nice um, kind of sneak peek into Apple's fitness laboratory. So I'm gonna see if I can play the video. And ABC's Rebecca Jarvis got an exclusive first look inside the lab where they're putting it to some extreme tests. Good morning, Rebecca. Hi, Lara, good morning to you. And what you're about to see may look like this stuff of science fiction, but it's actually one of the most advanced fitness labs in the world. Kept under wraps for nearly two years, no cameras, no outsiders allowed in until now. 
Behind this unassuming door, a covert operation at the world's most valuable company. Let's go check it out. All right, give it to me straight. How top secret is this place we are sitting in right now? You're the first person through that's not part of the Apple team, so it's pretty secret. Here, Apple employees secretly working out in high-tech gear worth millions of dollars for nearly two years. Rowing, running, downward dogging, and the kicker... They didn't even know what they were working on. A few people would would give it strange looks. I would be wondering if yeah. I was watching Breaking exactly. Bad. Exactly. It's a sci-fi episode of Breaking Bad. Exactly. Turns out it's all for this. The Apple Watch unveiled in September and on sale next month. Its most anticipated feature, Apple calls it a health kit. It allowed us to actually learn how do we measure uh, calorie burn and where does exercise actually start. Jay Blonick, Apple's director of fitness for health technologies, gave us the top secret fitness tour. How are you feeling? Thumbs up? <laughs> and what is she wearing on her head? That's to be able to trap exactly how hard is she breathing. It's the best way to really get to the truth of how many calories you're actually burning. Here we see climate chambers, where Apple is testing our body's response to different temperatures and levels of humidity. Get a chance to see inside. Here we go. Oh, this is chilly. Yeah. <laughs> so you can feel right now that doing an activity outside or coming in here, it really does replicate that kind of colder climate, and that's been really useful to us. All this sweating in secret, helping Apple strive for new peaks. Is this a game changer? You know, I think we've amassed already what may be one of the world's largest pieces of data on fitness, and our view is we're just beginning. The impact on health could be profound. So basically what what Apple's doing is they created one of the largest known databases of activity tracking. Um, some of the statistics coming out of here is that they basically employ 26 full-time nurses, 14 exercise physiologists, have collected more than 33,000 hours of fitness data from Apple volunteers, testing them in one of three temperature-controlled exercise rooms outside on bikes, on the floor of the main fitness facility, and then joining yoga studio. Uh, the claim is that the company owns more metabolic charts to, or carts, tools capable of determining exactly how hard an athlete is exercising and has possibly collected more exercise data than any other university sports lab or research institution in the world. Okay, so, um, you know, this is the sophistication that Apple's going for. And these are some of the major um, partnerships that have been announced uh, along with this, you know, major push towards health. Um, Mayo Clinic, uh, the in original partnership was um, announced, I believe, sometime in June of last year. Um, one of the more recent uh, headlines, Apple's health kit collaborator, collaborator Mayo Clinic launches its iOS 8 integrated health app. Um, Epic, so Oshner in uh, Louisiana is the sixth hospital system, was the first to link um, Epic to Apple's health kit. Okay, so basically getting EMR um, automatically populated into the health kit app. Um, IBM, so you know they have this major initiative going around uh, Watson Health and um, basically applying AI towards medicine. Uh, so an announcement came earlier this year that um, they're basically made, you know, uh, formally agreed to integrate Watson-based apps into HealthKit and Research Kit tool systems for developers. Um, there's also another side project going on where they're targeting Japanese seniors with, um, with providing them iPads with customized apps. Um, and then meanwhile, all these names, so John Hopkins, Allscripts, Cleveland Clinic, Mount Sinai, Kaiser, have one way or another kind of um, agreed to use HealthKit as sort of a port to um, transport EMR, electro electronic medical record data, to the patient. And these are all major institutions, um, I'm sure most of you are aware. And um, Epic, especially that partnership, I think, uh, turned a lot of heads because Epic had b been playing really... Um, uh, they're they're one of, considered one of the dinosaurs in the space. They own a lot of um, medical data, uh, patient data. I think um, the only system that has more electronic medical record data than Epic is uh, Kaiser, um, and plus or minus the VA. So um, the fact that Epic was willing to play nice with Apple was a, was a, uh, a very big and positive sign because uh, Epic hasn't been very friendly towards a lot of digital health startups in the past. Um, and it's been very tough to work with them because they have such a um, uh, conservative um, sort of mindset when it comes to experimenting with new technologies and new ways of um, handling their data, which is you know, very much um, a competitive advantage for them to kind of keep under wraps. At least um, that was the way they had, they had approached it in the past. So it looks like they're changing a little. Um, and this is a little bit of news coverage on 
um, these multiple partnerships. Apple is beefing up its health kit today to keep competitors at bay. That's a service that's developing that will allow health and fitness apps to work together. Reuters has learned the iPhone maker is talking to leading hospitals like Johns Hopkins and the Cleveland Clinic and electronic health records provider Allscripts to explore how they can work with HealthKit. The Cleveland Clinic says it's experimenting with it and providing feedback. Apple's already tied up with the likes of Nike, data provider Epic, and the Mayo Clinic. As of now, health data from medical devices and software apps aren't centrally stored. Apple wants to put all that in one place so consumers and healthcare providers can see that more easily. But getting all that together for mobile use won't be easy because Apple will have to confront consumer privacy concerns and satisfy at least half a dozen regulators. HealthKit is expected to be incorporated into the iPhone 6 that comes out in September. Apple's competitors include arch rival Samsung, whose latest smartphones and smartwatches can monitor your heart rate and how far you've walked, among other things. One thing that doesn't look too healthy, Apple's and Samsung's sales in emerging markets. Fitch Ratings predicts cheaper handsets from Asian rivals such as Xiaomi, Lenovo, Huawei and Micromax will steal market share from both of them next year, especially Samsung. Okay, so th that was just a kind of a brief video that was talking about um, s some of these specific partnerships and mentioning how, you know, the Mayo Clinic was um, basically gr green lighted last year. Um, hopefully this video goes through. There's been a lot of discussion about how successful the, the Apple Watch has been doing, um, you know, financially, economically, how many units have been sold and whether or not it's hitting forecasts. And it seems like the data is a little clouded, but this is a good discussion. Tech giant Apple reported earnings on Tuesday that beat expectations. However, concerns about iPhone and Apple Watch sales have some followers wondering what's next for the company. Joining us now to discuss the Apple Watch in particular is Ben Rubin, reporter at CNET. Ben, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks very much. So as many expected, Tim Cook did not break out Apple Watch figures. Why didn't he do that? And does it really make a difference whether or not investors and rivals know the actual numbers? Yeah, so you, you touched upon rivals. That's the main reason that Tim Cook provided as to why he decided, why Apple very clearly decided they didn't want to provide a lot of specifics about the Apple Watch. They said that they didn't want to tip their hand to competitors. Um, that matters a lot because we don't really know whether the Apple Watch met analyst expectations. Analysts were expecting uh, the Apple Watch to sell about $1.8 billion worth, and um, we, we don't really know whether they hit that number or not. And so I realize there's a lot of big question marks here, and the data is very, very limited. Based on your calculations, how do you think the watch did for the quarter? My expectation is, is that they probably missed expectations, but... Again, I, I don't know that for a yeah. fact. Um, at this point, the Apple Watch is bundled into this category called Other, uh, that includes Beats Electronics and iPods, and the Other category went up by about $950 million uh, from the year ago. So um, Tim Cook said that the Apple Watch did better than that $950 million, but again, that's nowhere near the $1.8 billion, so yeah. it's hard to say. Yeah, certainly. What do you think investors can look forward to regarding watch sales? I think that um, there's, there's going to be uh, at least a little bit more sales of the Apple Watch as people get to know it a little bit more as it comes into more retail stores also. Uh, they're going to be coming into three more countries by the end of the month. That's something Tim Cook mentioned on the call yesterday. So look out for that uh, sometime pretty soon. And of course, we're talking about Apple Watch, but iPhone is still, uh, it's still Apple's, really, it's, it's heavy lifter. What is your take on that before we wrap up this segment? So the iPhone uh, was, was the big uh, problem for Apple yesterday. Um, they came in about 2 million units shy of what uh, analysts were expecting them to sell, which uh, they, they still ended up selling 47.5 47 million total iPhones, but that wasn't really enough for the very lofty expectations people put on the iPhone. So um, we'll see if they can come back and um, do a bit of an improvement in the next quarter. It really is pretty incredible that 47 million iPhones could be short of expectations. It really speaks to how big Apple is around the world. Ben, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for watching. I'm Morgan Brennan. Have a great day. 
So th the best estimates I could get were somewhere between two and a half to three million units sold in the second quarter. Okay, so um, hopefully that kind of sets the stage and kind of gives you sort of a global view of you know what Apple's doing in healthcare and why I think really that the time is now. All these things just happened within the last year or two. Um, now a little bit about me and why I think you know well give you hopefully some qualifications for you know what I'm going to talk about next, which are the specific opportunities. Um, I, I had a, a European history. Uh, teacher in high school always said consider the source um, before you, you know, kind of listen or digest information that you get from a speaker or a book. Um, okay, so this is a little bit about me. Um, that's me right here. Fortunately, the red uh, doesn't represent, you know, disease, inherited disease in my family. These are actually all physicians, okay? So I'm, I'm the, um, you know, a child of two physicians and a sibling of physician. Uh, my brother-in-law is a physician as well. So I've, I grew up in a medical family um, but meanwhile, my dream was always towards entrepreneurship. Um, so when I graduated from Cal in 2001, I uh, double majored in biochemistry and business, and I went to Baylor College of Medicine, which had an MD, MBA combined degree program. Um, I didn't realize until I went there that because they were based in Houston, they were very focused on the oil and energy industry. So um, actually at the time, um, everyone in my class was just fresh out of Enron because they had just collapsed. And so I knew it wasn't the best fit and um, I was the only uh, person on the biomedical track um, in the business school and I said, okay, I'm just going to finish medical school, do my intern year, which I did in New York, um, obtain my physician's license, and then actually come back home to San Diego um, to complete my MBA. And they just um, started the MBA program. and you know, really advertised it and, and, you know, set it up so that it sat at the intersection of healthcare, life sciences, and entrepreneurship. And so I wrote on my application, Too Good to Be True. And um, they have a year-long lab to market uh, course in which I started my first project, which basically involved uh, looking for new technologies. So Scott um, is my teammate there. Um, he was working um, as Ready Staff, uh, creative director at the time. And basically the idea was that um, we were being told by professors at UC San Diego to go to these different research institutions, whether it be Spay Wars, Navy Lab, um, you know, Salk across the street, Burnham Institute, uh, or UCSD's tech transfer office, find new technologies, and then those w should be what we build business plans around and build teams around and run with. Um, what we realized is that it was the technologies, the research going on in those labs is very opaque, it's very hard to see, and usually the only marketing that's done for them is a patent that they just simply, you know, copy and paste onto their website. So we decided basically to sell pickaxes to gold miners, create videos, short videos around different technologies, and sort of create a tech tube, you know, YouTube for technologies, if you will. Um, and so it was a fun project. We learned a lot. Um, the thing was, you know, we had five MBAs on our team, and once graduation came, um, people wanted to get salaries and uh, take care of their children and, and things like that. So basically five MBAs went in five different directions. And the idea we like to say is comatose. It's not dead. We still think there's, um, <laughs> there's life behind it, but um, we moved on. And so um, kind of in the process afterwards, um, I was fortunate enough to meet through the business school a vent venture capitalist, local venture capitalist named Nasser Partovi. Um, some of you might recognize the name. He was former chair of ComNexus. And he had just gone through a terrible experience with his wife who was diagnosed with breast cancer. And he really just couldn't educate himself online about her disease um, or by talking to experts. And he was just really frustrated that she was going through this you know, very difficult process. Um, significant time in their life and he felt so uninformed. He felt so, you know, out of control or you know lacking control and that was just not his mo he wasn't used to just feeling so naive about something so important um, someone he, he cared about so basically he was really passionate about building patient education tools um, it started off simply by um, using billing codes diagnostic codes we got from continuing care documents to create personalized um, education for the um, for patients outside the hospital we kind of grew that into an enhanced patient health record system that did remote monitoring and peer support. Um, we ran clinical trials at UC San Diego, received FDA clearance. So one of the things that was my um, task as kind of basically the only medical person on the team at the time was to create, and this project's still going by the way, and it's um, fortunately it's gener generating revenue and being deployed at multiple hospitals. Um, one of my jobs was to create the education modules for the different patients. And so here we were, basically one of our um, value propositions was that we, we create unique content depending on your diagnosis. But the funny part was whether you had heart failure, diabetes, um, obesity, uh, chronic kidney disease, the end message was ultimately very similar. It was pretty much the same recommendations, which was you need to exercise, you need to sleep well, you need to manage stress, you need to ma uh, spend time with loved ones, and you need to watch what you eat. 
okay? And it was just those, like, basically, you know, it was a little bit of copy-pasting going on, right? Because it's the same message over and over to these d different disease categories. And so, you know, I had, I had obviously um, realized that to a certain degree throughout my training, but this just really brought it to light that, you know, there was something going on here. And um, this study, um, I think, really kind of hallmarked that in a different way because um, this came out of a lot of the gen genetic initiatives going on in San Diego. And so Dr. Eric Topol, which some of you might recognize the name, was one of the um, lead authors on the study. And um, the, this was published in New England Journal of Medicine, um, 2011. So still around this time while I was at Sanitas. And it was um, titled, Effective Direct-to-Consumer Genome-Wide Profiling to Assess Disease Risk. And um, the conclusion of the study, which was basically using, you know, user direct-to-consumer uh, genetic testing to um, assess disease risk and encourage behavior change was this. In a selected sample of subjects who completed follow-up after undergoing consumer genome-wide testing, such testing did not result in any measurable short-term changes in psychological health, diet, or exercise behavior or use of screening tests. Potential effects of this type of genetic testing on the population at large are not known. So the, the, the message here is that no matter what type of profile these folks were getting, the end message was always psychological health, diet, or exercise behavior, right? So it's that same theme that, you know, even if your, um, you know, specific genetic profile comes down to an elevated risk of heart disease, or someone else's comes up with an elevated risk of breast cancer, or someone else comes up with an ele elevated risk of diabetes, what's the message going to be from your provider to you at that point in time to either prevent or treat that disease? Exercise, eat better, sleep well. And so, you know, th th they were basically finding this out the hard way that just outlining what your specific disease risk is doesn't, doesn't necessarily nurture those behaviors. Um, so, okay, so the, the, way, the way that it kind of felt to me at the time was like, okay, there was a lot of action going on, whether it be genetics, stem cells, digital health, and I really needed to find my own space, you know, where I was going to make a contribution. And the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, really what it comes down to is us needing to take better care of ourselves, and that's where the bulk of the chronic disease that we're seeing today really comes down to, these same simple behaviors. I wanted to invest my time in that. And I actually was um, fortunate enough to hear a talk by Dean Ornish, who's clinical faculty at UC San Francisco, and um, actually alumni of the same medical school. So it was during my second year of medical school, and always this, this cartoon always stuck in my mind, where you have, these, you, know, you have these physicians kind of mopping up the floor here, but really, you know, the faucet's been turned on, and that's what needs to be addressed, right? So why not approach the root of these diseases? Why not address the cause? And really, that hasn't been going on in medicine, and as the, the reasons are, um, uh, there's a lot of reasons behind that, um, but without digressing too much, one of, one of the sort of the ma major overarching things, I think, um, to help frame what's going on in medicine is that, you know, we're evolving and disease is evolving, right? So <laughs> before things like starvation, trauma, infection used to, you know, af affect um, morbidity and mortality for major portion of the population. Fortunately, in developed nations, we have, you know, agriculture now, we have um, uh, first aid, um, we have vaccination, sanitation, right? So we've conquered these disease sets, but we're facing new ones. And so the approach for the next generation, for our generation to health, has to be different. Specifically, we're kind of moving from an acute care setting to a chronic care setting, right? So um, this is a metaphor that I learned in my neurobiology class in, in college where basically you take a frog and you stick it in boiling water, it'll jump out. But if you put that same frog in lukewarm water and you slowly boil it over time, it'll just sit there until it boils over and dies, right? And this is the type of disease that we're seeing in America today, right? It's lifestyle issues, it's sedentary lifestyle, it's processed foods, it's pollution. These are the things that we need to address. And um, Dr. David Cass, he's uh, president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, head of prevention at Yale. He's basically um, synopsizing a lot of the research going on in the pre preventive medicine space when he says that 80% of all chronic disease and premature deaths are preventable, right? And same going back to these same lifestyle behaviors. And so fortunately, this institution now exists, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. It's pretty new. It just uh, branched out of the American College of Preventive Medicine in 2004. And they're really advocating for these new set of vital signs, right? 
So the argument is that monitoring and ma uh, managing these parameters is actually more meaningful for current populations than um, the tra traditional uh, set of vital signs we used in the past, right? So if I knew my heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate right now versus you know, someone else's versus another person's, I wouldn't be able as a clinician to make very meaningful progno prognoses or predictions about that person's health or well-being. Um, versus if I knew they were, um, if you take these new set of vital signs, I knew how much exercise they were averaging per day or per week, if I knew what their nutrition outlook looked on a, on a daily uh, basis, if I knew how much sleep they were getting, all of a sudden I can have a much better idea what that person's risk for things like obesity, diabetes, the killers of today are, right? So does that make sense? So basically there's a shift now since we're going to chronic disease that the vital signs of the past are less relevant for the current population, which is usually outside the hospital, um, not in acute care settings. And so our, our outlook needs to change. Okay, are there any questions around that? First big pharma in this equation and the food industry. Okay, so big pharma, I think, you know, they are making moves now that they weren't making in the past. For, for example, with uh, obesity, right? But they're taking the traditional approach, was us which is using pills um, or devices or sur expensive surgeries. Um, and so the idea here is that with digital health, we can actually, um, you know, come on the preventive side and come up with new business models that are sustainable. And so, um, again, that's something that pharma is looking at. They haven't really jumped in or pioneered that yet because I think it's kind of out of their comfort zone. But they're, they're eyeing those opportunities and they're starting these health IT research initiatives and um, even investment arms to kind of you know, make sure that they cover that when the time's right. But that's the opportunity. Um, it's, it's not really using these, um, even though there's, there's, um, there's business being made on you know, coming up with pills and surgeries and devices um, to basically do a fancier version of what you saw before, which is still mopping up the floor and not addressing the root cause of things like obesity, diabetes, um, heart disease. But um, what the, what there's a large growing number of physicians looking at the possibilities that can, get, that can be done upstream, right? And so this is, um, this is something that's coming from um, now from multiple uh, major major players in the healthcare space, right? So this is coming from physicians. I mentioned the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, this is coming from the government level, right? So we know that the healthcare economic crisis is actually a national economic crisis. And so um, this is happening from, um, you know, from obviously the healthcare reform initiatives, putting more emphasis in preventive, preventive health. Um, it's coming from insurers. Um, it's coming from corporate insurers. So Starbucks spends more on healthcare for its employees than it does on coffee, beans, or rent, for example, right? So we know that um, healthcare addressing chronic disease is a, um, is a major issue um, for, for not, you know, for, and especially when you consider census studies of where um, the data is going to look like in 2030 and 2050. And so um, people who are planning ahead are looking at prevention as a major cost-effective tool to addressing this. Does that make sense? Yeah. Makes sense from the business side, but from the population side, getting the, pop the general population to embrace for better. Yeah. Right. So this is our job. And, and this is the exciting part, if you ask me. <laughs> because um, really, I think people want to be healthy, right? And so you have to access that part of them. Until, it means until they understand that they can't have that piece of pizza, then they're not so into it. <laughs> Well, um, you, you, can present, you can present alternatives. And how you present them and the way you present it, that's, that's kind of where, where these opportunities lie. And is it coming up with those clever ways to do that? You know, for example, the Fitbit. Um, I was gonna say my fitness pal, but that's really, you know, that, that's the worried well, I think that used that more than um, the, tr the category that you're mentioning. Right, so uh, brushing teeth and cigarette smoking are two great examples of public health campaigns that are considered very successful, right, with time. Um, those are obviously very expensive education efforts, um, but if you, t if you look at specifically the current ob obesity efforts, the diabetes efforts, um, there's a large growing contingent of young, um, socioeconomically well-off people who are very cognizant of this, and actually, you know, there's cachet now involved with being very, um, 
you know, fitness savvy or, you know, be belonging to um, a gym or going to yoga class, right? That didn't really exist before. So that shift is slowly happening. All right, so now I'm going to talk specifically about, you know, what efforts are being made to make these behaviors more adoptable um, and attractive for the user, because that's really where the creativity comes in, where the innovation has to happen. Um, so I'm just going to go through each lifestyle vital sign uh, we discuss and kind of one by one address the digital health opportunities that I think we could take advantage of. Um, and, and this was really the red flag that kind of, I think, you know, really motivated me to enter a space. And, um, you know, we used it in the tagline for the talk because it's, it's really a big deal. Um, in 2005, the New England Journal of Medicine published a study with authors from University of Illinois, Harvard, and um, UC San Francisco that said the youth of today may on average live le less healthy and possibly even shorter lives than their parents because of the current obesity and diabetes epidemics that we're seeing, right? So it's never really happened, it's never happened in modern human history where the parent gener uh, the child generation is actually expected to have a shorter lifespan and poorer quality of life than the parent generation. Um, so it's a major red flag. And so what, what's being done in the digital health space to um, encourage um, or basically help people monitor and manage their nutrition outside the clinic, right? And that's really the goal here. So MyFitnessPal, um, as you know, has been a very successful example, um, recently acquired by Under Armour. And um, I believe the numbers are close to 100 million, um, if not beyond that, in terms of number of users. Um, uh, so, and, and it's basically a food library, right? So you have to go through, and that's why I hesitated when I said, you know, it's kind of one of these attractive measures because it's really um, more savvy folks, I think, that are using it um, on a regular basis, at least the more active users. Um, but it is being used, right? So, so we know that um, Un Under Armour acquired it for like 150 million, I think. Okay, so does yeah. that mean that are less likely to have both access and to the tools and access to the information and therefore are relegated to right, that, that's, that's horrible that's lives? No, I think I think that's not what anyone you know wants or um, anticipates. But th the reality is that you know these devices or tools or software systems start in, in, um, in places where they can happen and then eventually the goal is to distribute that more largely, right? So um, MP3 players, I think, is a good example, right? So iPod started in very, you know, privileged population, but gradually became more accessible with time. Organic foods, I think, is another example of that. So um, even though if it starts in one place, the, the, the goal is to grow it. Um, and so basically, this is just a food diary. There's a lot of room for improvement, right? You have to either take um, pictures of your food um, or you have to log it in through, through their food library. Uh, MealSnap is a purely um, uh, 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 picture-driven um, app um, where they, there's been a couple at, um, attempts around trying to um, come up with ways to analyze information that's, that's um, brought to the app via pictures. There's been crowdsourcing attempts, uh, for example, by using Amazon Turk, um, and then there's been um, just really in-house attempts where they try to try to mine through these. Um, um, but so far, there hasn't been any successful examples of this, but there's a lot of attempts still ongoing in terms of basically food logging by taking pictures and then finding a cost-effective and accurate way to actually gauge nutrition content. Um, the reason why it's very difficult, you would need two angles to get depth of food. Um, you can't tell, for example, what type of oils are being used. Um, it's a very challenging route, but the idea is that if you can get 80% of the way there, then it's still meaningful. Um, and I just want to mention that these guys do um, the bar barcode scanning too, right? So Jawbone does that as well, and that's a very popular way to do it. Um, so where, where can this go? How, this, how, you know, how can this be improved? Um, th so there's hardware attempts, and then there's additional software attempts. So Yumly is you know, a popular app that's out there right now. And um, yeah, I, I put that up as a model. So they're doing um, you know, customized recipes and then uh, delivering uh, groceries um, based off your choices. Um, and they're really generalizing their, um, their, mark, their uh, value proposition towards basically all categories. So you can imagine, if this, is, if this proves to be a successful business model, just pick your disease category of choice, and there'd be ways to replicate that in a deeper way for whether it be um, you know, diabetes, you know, uh, pre-diabetes would be a nice, small, um, and very powerful um, uh, population to target, uh, chronic kidney disease, um, 
there's basically um, heart disease, cardiac rehab, so people fresh, um, that are coming right out of a heart attack that need to be on very specific diets. There's a lot of ways that if this business model proves successful, it can be replicated for different disease categories. Um, the Heal Bee is um, kind of a notorious piece of vaporware that was on Indiegogo. Um, I put that up there because it represents what Apple's trying to do um, and what really everyone's trying to do, whether it be Dexcom, Google, um, anyone who's making hardware that's doing any kind of body monitoring, which is passive glucose tracking, right? That's like the holy grail for the space. Um, Heal Bee claimed to do that. They had a wildly successful Indiegogo campaign, but there's been no um, shipments made and um, no real proof of their technology. Um, but um, non-invasive glucose tracking is a major, um, major category yet to be really uh, addressed. I, I think it's actual Nobel Prize territory in terms of how difficult it will be. Um, Dexcon just announced a major partnership with Google um, to, to make really small versions of their devices that are currently out um, for the type 2 um, population, which would be a, a, huge, a huge move for them if they're successful. Right now, De um, Dexcom's just targeting top type 1 population. Um, Bitbyte, uh, this was a successful Indiegogo campaign that basically used an earpiece to monitor um, when uh, someone's eating and for how long and the pace of that, that um, meal. So um, it, it is pretty funny, but at the same time, it represents uh, real science that's coming out that shows when you eat might be just as important as what you eat. And so even though this might be a very uncomfortable way of, of pulling that off, you can imagine that in Apple's health ecosystem, if you can somehow use GPS accelerometry, accelerometry um, machine learning, maybe there's a, a headphone um, piece of it as well, whether it be you know, Beats or something else. But if you can actually track when and how long someone's eating, that's actually a meaningful proxy for calorie count, um, which is you know, obviously proven to be very uh, elusive and hard to pull off. Um, and so this was actually um, supported by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine as a meaningful tool. Um, the Vessel Cup um, basically claims to be able to, um, you know, in, uh, in interpret what kind of uh, fluids you're drinking and, you know, give you caffeine levels or sugar levels or, um, you know, that type, type of data tracking from your beverage beverages. Um, it hasn't shipped either, right? So that's another one that's just kind of um, still has some question marks around it. But these are the ideas coming out um, that, you know, basically could make uh, nutrition tracking more passive and e easier to um, once again monitor, manage, measure. Um, and just to show how strong the appetite is for passive glucose sensing, um, there was one study that came out of UC San Diego um, from their, um, they have a dedicated wearable devices lab now, and it only had around six subjects and it was a tattoo based sensor and it got international press based off its results, right? So um, I think most, folk, most of you all are aware that, you know, a, a any kind of preclinical study with six subjects, you, r you really d don't take that data too seriously. And the fact that you know, this made the Atlantic, this made the Times of India and Medgadget shows how hungry the appetite is for this technology. Um, so this was just from, uh, I believe, end of last year? A beginning of this year was published. Is that Mr. Dr. Coleman? No, that's not his lab. It's, um, I believe, Wang. So, okay, exercise is another major lifestyle vital sign. And so, you know, this is kind of, you know, behind the scenes, one of the root sort of um, public health sort of, uh, th th this is what's causing a lot of our sedentary lifestyle, right? It's, our, it's driving to work, spending, you know, eight hours in front of the screen, maybe you get an hour off for lunch, driving home, spending the rest of your night in front of a screen and going to sleep, right? So it's the definition of sedentary lifestyle. If you do this um, for, you know, 20, 30 years, you're pretty much guaranteed to get at least one major chronic disease. So, um, and this was me today, right, as I was putting slides together for this talk, and, you know, basically, you know, we're, si we're spending significant amounts of our time in front of a computer um, with poor posture and um, exposing our eyes to circumstances they haven't really been built for, and so we can expect to see um, chronic disease. <laughs> and um, specifically here, once again, you know, that screen life, we're actually averaging um, over eight hours a day now staring at a screen. And so if we're sleeping eight hours, that means over half our waking life is spent looking at a screen. And so those lifestyles are very sedentary. And um, we've seen, fortunately, good examples of companies that have been able to make some sort of positive impact. Um, and just, you know, strapping something on your wrist, 
Um, this Moves app obviously requires no ex external hardware, and Garmin has been a major player in the wearable devices category for years. Um, we're seeing um, good adoption, and um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about how after six months, at least one third of Fitbit users no longer use their device. After six months, at least 50%, if not more, of patients stop taking medications and the other devices they're prescribed on a regular basis. So Fitbit's actually outperforming um, a lot of medications if one third is actually the number. So I, I think that statistic needs to be taken with a huge grain of salt. Um, and so the opportunity, how this you know, basically evolves, and so we all, we all know Fitbit was the, the darling success story, at least pre um, recent, uh, uh, I don't know if it collapse is the right word, but I think you know uh, Fitbit was valued around nine billion. I don't know what happened after this last couple of days, but it's still, I think we're somewhere around eight billion, seven billion. So we know it's a successful example. Um, and how do we improve from there? So uh, Misfit has been all about trying to get these devices to really be seamless and beautiful, and you know really capitalize on the fact that these are fashion accessories that are coming out now. And so they partnered with Swarovski, right, to make these high-end activity trackers. Um, this is the Amigo. Um, I believe they're based out of Texas. And their whole um, value proposition was trying to get more specific with the data tracking. So if you're doing reps in a gym or if you're doing yoga or biking, um, you should be able to track that as well. And we know that's a huge research initiative, not just for their team, but um, you know, for, for every major team in the space. Um, Athos do is doing smart clothing. Um, and actually, so there was a recent interview um, with, um, I believe it was Jay Glanick, um, Apple's uh, the main uh, health guy. And um, they were talking about opportunities for the Apple Watch. And uh, specifically, they're tar tar talking about targeting these uh, exercises that aren't simply um, step driven. And so they're, they're basically mentioning having apps that talk to smart clothing or even smart dumbbells to capture these things we do at the gym that aren't captured by um, this, the simple uh, wrist-based activity tracker. Um, other room for improvement, these are um, uh, two apps, Swerkit and Fitstar. So Fitstar was actually recent, recently acquired by Fitbit, and Swerkit has been um, kind of hitting uh, a lot of the top charts. They're basically really personalizing the workouts, getting really customized with the workouts they're delivering and um, getting big on life coaching as well, right? So you get you know, high-end athletes kind of driving the workouts. Um, and basically, um, there's, a, there's a really nice quote in Moby Health News that came from James Park, Fitbit CEO, which is, you know, we're getting all this data, but we need to find ways that users can actually, um, we, can, we can create personalized workouts for the users based on the data we're getting. And so that was um, a big driver of Fitstar acquisition for them. And so apparently that's what they're seeing as the next major step for their firm. Sleep. Okay, so um, about 60, 70 million Americans complain of some sort of sleep disorder. Um, if you talk to certain uh, scientists, public health experts, we're actually going through an epidemic of circadian rhythm disorders because our sleep-wake cycle has been essentially shifted away from the rise and fall of the sun because we are exposed by technology on a, you know, essentially 24-7 pattern. We became social shift workers with the way that we um, you know, basically live our lives. Um, and we know that shift working or living with poor circadian rhythms is a serious health issue. The uh, World health, or health Organization has actually labeled it a probable carcinogen in the same class as UV radiation. And there's a lot of studies coming out about its links to obesity. Uh, night shift work uh, produces a 50% increased risk for, risk for heart disease, 30% increased risk for diabetes. So we know that Managing our sleep cycles is very important long-term uh, preventive health um, vital sign. And uh, what's going on now is uh, we've seen, well, Zio come and go, right? So the head-based approaches to tracking sleep. We've seen the wrist-based approaches with arguable accuracy. Um, basis with its optical sensors is considered to be one of the more accurate on the market in terms of wrist-based sleep monitors, um, which makes us think that um, you know, basically they're integrating the heart rate data into their sleep analysis. Um, so Apple should have an opportunity there. They also have the optical heart rate sensor. Um, at least as far as I can tell, it's the battery life issue that's really prevented them from, from making it a current feature. And, you know, basically the expectation is that you charge it overnight because it needs a daily charge. Um, but hopefully that's one way it can grow. 
Um, and here's kind of the innovation that um, at least I see happening now. Um, a local company, ResMed, bought Bianca Med, um, which I think was an EU-based company, but it's doing non-invasive sleep tracking based on respiratory rate. Um, and then there's LifeX. There's a lot of companies doing this now, which are essentially smart light bulbs um, that are usually controlled by an app um, to help control the lighting so that you'll actually sense or know when it's almost time to go to sleep. And kind of tied in with that, there's uh, Flux, which um, basically limits blue light that you would get from your phone or your devices, because uh, we know that blue light inhibits melatonin release, which is supposed to help you go to sleep at nighttime. And so if you're continuing to look at your iPhone or iPad, it's actually blocking the melatonin directly. Um, unfortunately, the iPhone hasn't enabled it yet, um, so there's some jailbreaks jailbreaking methods apparently in, in order to get that happening. Sleep Cycle is a phone-based sleep monitor. Um, its accuracy has uh, actually been, um, been said to be very low, um, but the reality is it works like a timer, so you're actually supposed to turn it on when you go to sleep and press it when you <laughs> wake up, and then it, it tracks your sleep, right? So um, I don't know if that really counts, but that's what it's doing. Um, and then Bedit is um, a product by Misfit, and basically, it's a mattress sensor that you put on your bed and obviously can tell if you're on there or if you're not. And so it gets your sleep tracking that way. Um, okay, so stress management. So, um, you know, stress is one of these fuzzy things that we don't always talk about um, or is being talked about a lot more um, in terms of public health. And the reality is that heart disease is our number one killer in the United States. Stress is a major contributing factor. And the most common mode of death for an American is actually a heart attack uh, 9.30 a.m. on a Monday morning. Okay, so we know that stress is a big deal and um, that we need better ways to control that. And so, th um, so that's why there's so, much research, there's so much research going on in things like meditation, yoga, deep breathing. And we're living in, in you know, an era of digital distraction, right? So we're getting messages, um, you know, countless number of emails, texts per day. And so it's getting harder to kind of stay grounded. Bless you. So there, there's, a, there's a need to help us sort of manage ourselves, um, especially as it relates to stress. Um, there's basic mood trackers out there right now. Uh, Will is actually a company that came out from uh, the founders of Lululemon. And it's supposed to be like one minute meditations that you can do throughout the day. Um, and so some of where um, I think the more exciting things for the future, um, there, there are companies trying to track your stress levels uh, through devices. Um, and that's been proven really difficult, but Spire was actually started by um, a PhD from Stanford's, um, I believe, design and engineering schools. And um, basically they're using um, a belt-based device that can track your respiratory rate and actually tell when you're kind of going through normal breathing patterns or more stressed breathing patterns or calm breathing patterns and try to encourage you to um, you know, adjust your behavior accordingly. Bliss Buzzer came out of UC San Diego, out of Qualcomm Institute. Um, they were using heart rate interval to try to detect, um, you know, when your more stressful or blissful um, times were, and get you to encourage your behavior change that way. Um, Headspace has proven to be pretty popular. It's, uh, I think, more customizable and gamified uh, meditation apps. So it's, um, and they have a really good um, sort of founder. Um, I, th I think he spent a lot of time in um, monasteries and so has a credible reputation behind him. Um, Mind Body Connect is coming out of Mind Body Online, which recently IPO'd. And so we know that the mindfulness yoga space, once again, is a growing sector. Um, if you count yoga as a sport, it's actually the fastest growing sport at 20% compound annual growth rate. So once again, it's actually becoming cool and um, popular to do these things. Um, and so um, Mind, Mind Body Online, they actually started as um, a business uh, software management platform for yoga studios and Pilates studios and acupuncturists. And now um, their, their new initiative, Mind Body Connect, is actually helping users find these different vendors of services in their local area. Okay, so love is probably the hardest lifestyle medicine or lifestyle vital sign to talk about, but the reality is um, it's important and um, there's a growing number, of there's a lot of research growing around this, um, specifically because of the aging population. We know that one of the uh, major contributing factors to cognitive decline in this population, to depression and dementia, is social isolation. So maintaining long-term and nurturing long-term relationships is actually a major preventive health pillar for these folks. And then we know it's true on the 
um, you know, and, and all in terms of all age demographics, especially as it relates to mental health. Um, and so there's more research and attention being paid to nurturing social relationships. Um, once again, this research comes out of American College of Lifestyle Medicine, uh, Dean Ornish at UC San Francisco, and actually Blue Zone Studies uh, from National Geographic, uh, where they actually sent uh, National Ge Ge Geographic explorers to study communities that had much higher than average lifespans. So certain communities in the world, um, such as Icaria, Greece, um, Loma Linda, California, Okinawa, Japan, that just produce more centenarians than average, um, than, um, and significantly su such, to the point where um, they sent out teams to study these different communities, see what the commonalities are. And s strong social structure is one of the major, major findings in National Geographic uh, Blue Zone studies, that these folks in Okinawa, Japan, for example, they have uh, small, tight-knit groups um, formed at the age of, I believe, four or five years old, that they'll maintain and nurture these relationships all the way through their 80s, uh, essentially till they die. And they basically are a group of about five uh, women, in this case, that will just form these lifelong friendships that are made <coughs> and kind of coached by the community at a very early age. So this is what's happening now, and this is why it's an issue, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so face-to-face -face, uh, contact is important, and it's not happening as much as it used to. And so the solutions here are tough because some of them actually, you know, use the same technology to try to get back to that face-to-face, -face, right? So, you know, Tinder is a perfect example where you end up sp maybe spending more time on your phone to hopefully get that right face-to-face -face contact at the end. Um, Gather app is um, Bluetooth, um, basically tracking your friends or social uh, contacts and, you know, let's say a college-wide vicinity or um, Bluetooth radius, essentially. Um, Independa is a local company that's basically addressing head-on the issue of um, the aging population, specifically in nursing home or um, um, remote care settings, where they're basically at risk of just spending all their time on a couch watching TV, not really talking to their loved ones, which we know is a major part of their um, nourishment and, um, you know, helps uh, basically sustain their cognitive power. So um, Independence focusing on that. Um, other opportunities, so we know that Apple Watch is trying to do some, you know, potentially, I don't know how you feel about it, maybe creepy things, um, sending your heart rate, you know, with like these kind of real-time images to your loved ones. I, I don't know how that's going to be interpreted, but, you know, once again, they actually use the word intimacy. They want to create intimacy with these devices. So is that a step in the right direction or not? I guess time will tell. Uh, Google Glass, at least maybe with, the, with that type of device, you can actually measure or monitor how much face-to-face -face time you're having with other people and actually who those people are. Um, so you know that, well, if, if I, I see the shaking head, but the reality is if you have, a, you know, um, a grandparent or a parent who's really, you know, at risk of basically spending all their time alone, you kind of want to know that at least they're talking to the neighbor X number of minutes or hours per day or to someone X number of minutes or hours per day. Um, so there, there could be meaning behind that. Showing that that face-to-face -face contact is more meaningful to you than electronic contact. Well, the, I, I would I would be interested. I don't think how do I put it? There's a lot of studies showing that face-to-face -face, um, strong social networks, um, nurturing long-term relationships is healthy. Helps prevent risk for all types of chronic diseases, whether it be heart disease, um, diabetes, metabolic syndrome. Um, mental health issues, for example. And, and Interesting counter example where I'm spending a lot of time at home because I'm out of work right now. And of course, my wife is going to work, so I don't see her during the day. But I am able to maintain contact with um, groups, Blue Angel Group, Aviation Photography Group. And these are people who are similar to me, and we can share interests and stories. And at least it keeps me from just totally isolated. Right. Well, so I, th I think that's the interesting part is that these technologies can also be part of the solution, too, right? So even though they might be causing, you know, major part of the problem in terms of our, you know, diminishing face-to-face -face contact, um, you know, for example, actually, one of the, one of the next, next examples that I bring up is this personalized health coach, which is kind of like um, her, if you remember that movie. Um, is it Joaquin Phoenix? Um, that, you know, basically, um, I, I, I see a lot of the, 
um, kind of health tech companies going in this direction where they're trying to create real-time life coaches or health coaches, someone that can be your virtual buddy, for example. Um, in this case, you know, Vital Health has actually real people behind it. Um, but I think there's something meaningful here that whether it's one person or a community, um, that if you can actually leverage technology to help fight the same problems it's causing, it's real. So, you know, FaceTime, I think, is a great example of that, where, you know, um, the fact that we're living in more remote family settings is actually, you know, being bridged through technology as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's a difficult, I think, topic to explore, but I think the end message, or at least the end goals, would be to at least in some way measure or monitor the amount of love that we're experiencing. And I know that's really hard, fuzzy con uh, concept, but I'll explain why that's important. And then also to nurture or grow that amount of love that we're exposed to. So, um, you know, basically a diagnostic tool and a treatment tool. And, and the reason why this is important to get some sort of metrics on is because as a primary care physician, right, if you agree, if you know that at the end of the day for all these major categories of chronic disease that we're seeing that are not aff only affecting millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of lives, but also damaging to um, a very unhealthy extent our, extent our national budgets, right? And they're basically not sustainable to take care of. So if you know that all these major categories of chronic disease are reduced to the same five behaviors, right? And your 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 primary care physician looking at your patient who's trying to preve prevent or treat, once again, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, uh, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, ADHD, first line of treatment, best mode of prevention is lifestyle, osteoporosis, the list goes on. You want to send that patient out of your clinic and not have, when they come back six months later, a total black box with no information to know how they did on each of these five categories. Because that's how it is now. You really have no idea. You say, okay, I want you to exercise. I want you to sleep better. I want you to eat better. I want you to manage your stress. I want you to spend time with loved ones. You send the patient out of the clinic. They come back six months later. You have nothing to work from. So the idea is to actually create something for those interactions. When you do that follow-up visit, you say, look, I went from A to B. I went from A to G. You see the progress. You monitor and measure. Monitor and manage those behaviors. Yeah, you probably can assume that they're not going to do it. Now the question is, having the device you might make you do it. So I, I think that's probably more of the, you know, the benefit of those devices. Because I mean, really, I mean, who does what the, the doctor tells us more than two months? No. <laughs> well, um, you know, I think these are really going to be cultural changes that we have to see. Um, and once again, the fact that, you know, being fit is cool now, and, you know, this, this shows up on Instagram or these different social media platforms that are popping up where people are showing, you know, how much they're lifting in the gym or showing the size of, you know, th these are actually, as, as much as those might be extreme examples, those are positive signs that, you know, there's a cultural change where, you know, and especially in these socioeconomic classes where they're being educated on, you know, how food is impacting their health or, you know, how lifestyle is impacting their health, there's actually cognition and change going on in the culture. And, and again, I think the prime example of that is what we see in, you know, just the yoga space, for example, um, and what that represents, um, or Whole Foods as a phenomenon, for example. Let's go back though, to what you said about the that after six months, how many percentage aren't doing it, which is, what you said, 30 percent, if I'm not mistaken, aren't, aren't using it anymore. And you said that that was even better than the results for people on medication. So right. when the doctor says, go away, and I need your, you know, your information about your love interactions, <laughs> six months when you come back. Well, I mean, think about it. Would, would you rather take a medication that was just approved by the FDA, you know, less than a year ago, and we don't really still know what the side effects are? Or would you rather, you know, you w would you rather be told to sleep more um, as, a, as a form of your therapy? And Human beings, particularly in the yeah. United States, where we're kind of gluttons and we have so many choices and we live the easy life and everything is just out there, we don't. I think, I think the, the data show that shows that that's not necessarily true and it's definitely not true for everyone, right? So, and, and, the, and the reality is that the people that are using the, these devices represent a growing socio, uh, a growing demographic. So um, that's why there's business opportunity there, and that's why we see all these major companies putting a lot of investment in this direction. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, I, I want to make sure we get to it before we have to. Can you talk about the 
can you describe the value proposition? It looks like it's a behavior modification tool, pretty much. But I'm trying to understand yeah. how you differentiate it from the work of Cornish or uh, somebody else in the prevention. Right. So actually, I'm, we're trying to build off what Ornish has created. And essentially, um, if you take into account that there's these five basic behaviors we need to do on a regular basis in order to live long, healthy lives, um, there's only 24 hours to do them, right? And so we end up needing to plan that into our day. Um, otherwise, it simply won't happen, right? So um, and what, you know, the number one reason people will give you for not being able to sleep eight hours or to get their workout in or to meditate would be to say that they don't have time. So if you know that you're limited to this finite 24 hours and that this is a change that you want to make in your lifetime, you can start coming up with an equation that makes sense for you. Right? So basically what we're doing is we're mixing, we're integrating your calendar and um, your Fitbit, for example. Right? So we're, we're, we're merging those platforms um, where you can actually manage your health on the same platform that you're managing your day. Um, so it's, it's com combining the calendar with, um, with health tracking, essentially. So it's Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the idea is supposed to be kind of fun that you can play around with it. So, you know, especially, um, you know, on the iPad, you have kind of, you can just kind of, um, you have more room to kind of play around with things and sort things out and sort of optimize your schedule. But um, the idea is that, you know, you have 24 hours and you have certain goals that you have in line, especially when you keep reducing it to the same five lifestyle factors. At a certain point, um, a certain point you need to actually go ahead and think about how that fits into your 24 hours and then start coming up with rhythms that you can um, you know, use on a regular basis, um, change on the weekends if necessary. Yeah, change that. But including my download, how many people have downloaded this since you've developed it? We, we have 30,000 downloads. Exactly. And our retention rates are actually pretty good. But you don't so. charge Right, so you know we have business models lined up. So yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm happy to discuss. Yeah. Right. No, I mean you know so a lot of these major companies start off um, free, but then they built more sophisticated pro versions that they charge a subscription for, and so that's likely the direction we'll head. Yeah. Um. I think we skipped ahead to someone who knows what your product is. Can you tell us? What sure. Yeah, so you know, basically always is, we call it the world's first wellness planner. And essentially what we're getting at is if you know that there's these five basic behaviors you need to do on a regular basis outside of work and you know, traditional errands and things that end up on your day planner or calendar, then at a certain point you need to plan that into your day. And the really exciting thing that I think um, is not being taken advantage of right now is that, is that the common denominator for each one of these five lifestyle vital signs is time. So if you can actually track, monitor, manage, measure these five lifestyle vital signs in terms of hours and minutes, it's actually a very simplified and unique approach to uh, prevention. Um, and it's holistic, so it's not just focused on one or two pieces of the puzzle, but it's actually looking at the whole platform. Um, and so the idea is that you would actually sync this to your watch. So the, the, the long-term goal is that every time you look down at your, at your smartwatch or your Apple watch, you'll actually get cued into what the best um, activity, the healthiest, most product productive activity for you at that moment in time would be. And so it's supposed to recenter you instead of distract you, which a lot of our technology is currently doing. It's supposed to help you kind of come back to your internal goals um, and basically help you um, plan out your day and s prioritize um, what's most important to you. So we've talked to a few, um, and right now we're kind of happy with the traction we're getting direct to consumer, and we're being advised um, by certain advisors and investors that um, we should grow this out until until we need to make that transition. So, so, <laughs> so um, Scott on our team is back there. He's the creative director. And Jeff was actually um, le led our iOS development for quite some time, and now he's playing an advising consulting role. Um, but we are recruiting. Um, we would like um, you know, more iOS developers actively involved, so please talk to any one of us and you know, let us know if you're interested. Um, and once again, I think if you, if you search for it, there's, there's no calendars or day planners that are geared around health. Um, and that's really a unique value proposition we're bringing to the table. Um, and so we're one of the first to do that, um, to focus, you know, day planning around health because um, we know how growing, how growingly important this is, if that makes sense. 
So um, I think uh, it's, it's a cool space to be, especially with you know the tracking capabilities that can be layered on top of that, um, especially as Apple Watch comes out and what we can do with the display and the tracking in tandem. Um, so. OK, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.